In this captivating video, we'll delve into the hidden stories of the women who stood steadfastly behind notorious gangsters like Al Capone, El Chapo, and John Gotti, showcasing their incredible resilience in the ruthless world of underground crime. Join me as we unearth the untold tales of the wives of these infamous figures. Victoria De Giorgio Gotti was born on December 5, 1942, in Brooklyn, New York, into a turbulent family. Her parents toiled as factory workers, and by the time she was two, her family had already endured a split. While the details of her early life and education remain shrouded in mystery, it is believed that Victoria began engaging in minor criminal activities at a young age. In 1958, fate led her to a chance encounter at a nightclub where she met John Joseph Gotti, a ruthless Italian mobster. This serendipitous meeting ignited an immediate and passionate romance between the two. Four years later, on March 6, 1962, they exchanged vows, cementing their bond. At the tender age of 20, Victoria De Giorgio found herself on a tumultuous journey into the world of criminality, deeply in love with John Gotti. Their marriage bore fruit as they became the proud parents of five wonderful children. However, as time passed, John Gotti's criminal activities and indulgences began to weigh heavily on Victoria's conscience. She grew increasingly uncomfortable with her husband's illicit pursuits, feeling betrayed when he introduced their eldest son, John Gotti Jr., into the world of organized crime. In addition to these trials, the Gotti family had to endure the heartbreaking loss of their youngest child, Frank Gotti, who tragically passed away at the tender age of 12. In a tragic turn of events, Frank Gotti's life was cut short when he fell victim to a drunk driver while riding a minibike in March 1980. This heart-wrenching incident plunged Victoria into a deep depression, leading her to grapple with thoughts of suicide. Unverified reports even suggested that she remained confined to her bed for an entire year following Frank's untimely death. Despite her reservations about John Gotti's lifestyle and the immense emotional trauma of losing her son, Victoria made a choice to stay in the marriage, holding on to the hope that their tumultuous love story might eventually find a happier ending. Meanwhile, John Gotti was primarily focused on advancing his criminal career. He rose to power as the head of the notorious Gambino crime family by violently toppling its leader, Paul Castellano, in a dramatic shootout on December 16, 1985. After a brief period of relative calm, Victoria's worst fears materialized in 1992 when a rival gang uncovered damning evidence against John Gotti, this information was promptly handed over to the authorities, leading to Gotti's arrest. Subsequently, John faced a litany of charges, including murder, illegal gambling, tax evasion, and racketeering. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. His passing left Victoria to shoulder the immense responsibility of raising their four children on her own. I pretty much raised my children alone, with Johnny being away for years at a time, so it broke my heart," Victoria confided to the New York Daily News in 2006. She felt a profound sense of betrayal, deeming it the most painful betrayal she had ever experienced, even more so than dealing with other women. Nonetheless, Victoria embraced her new role as both mother and father to her family with a profound sense of duty. After her husband's death, she took deliberate steps to sever all connections with the Gambino gang, determined to shield herself and her children from potential harm. In addition, she embraced a quieter, more low-key lifestyle as she sought to fill the void left behind by the former mafia boss. Unfortunately, legal troubles continued to plague the Gotti family, even after John's demise. Their eldest son, John Gotti Jr., encountered his own legal difficulties with significant run-ins with the law in 1998. During his time behind bars, John Gotti Jr. faced numerous charges related to gambling and extortion. Throughout this difficult period, Victoria remained a steadfast pillar of support for her son, unwaveringly standing by his side until he finally regained his freedom in December 2009. Since then, it appears that she has retreated back into a more private life. Today, Victoria Di Giorgio Gotti is in her 80s and is estimated to be worth around $2 million. However, the source of her wealth remains shrouded in mystery, much like her late husband's illicit activities. Maria Licciardi, affectionately nicknamed Pictorella, 
due to her petite stature, is an iconic figure in the world of organized crime, both in Italy and beyond. Born on March 24, 1951, in the Neapolitan suburb of Italy, Maria grew up in a family deeply entrenched in the world of gangsters. Her father was a prominent figure, and her brothers held high-ranking positions within the Camorra mob. It was almost inevitable that she would enter into a marriage with Antonio Takumi, another influential member of the Camorra clan. However, Maria Liziardi chose not to fade into the shadows after the arrest of her husband and two brothers. Without hesitation, she stepped into the limelight, taking over as the leader of the Second Digliano Alliance. Initially, many doubted her ability to lead a violent gang, especially given that she was the first female Camorra boss of the Licciardi clan, but Maria dispelled those doubts by assuming her responsibilities with a combination of professionalism and ruthlessness. Upon assuming leadership, the diminutive queen of the criminal underworld forged a formidable alliance with twenty disparate criminal clans, strengthening the power of the mob even further. Maria Licciardi introduced several innovations, some of which defied the rules and regulations of the criminal organization. One of her most significant changes was the establishment of a highly profitable prostitution ring, which became a major source of revenue for the group. Maria orchestrated the acquisition of young girls, primarily Albanian, for the sum of $2,000 each. She promised them legitimate employment, but upon their arrival in Italy, these vulnerable girls were coerced into drug addiction and forced into prostitution. In addition to overseeing the prostitution ring, Maria Licciardi orchestrated numerous acts of aggression and violence against rival mafia gangs and law enforcement agencies. During a tumultuous six-month period between January and July in the year 2000, gang wars involving Maria's group resulted in at least 53 deaths. Throughout her career in the criminal underworld, she reportedly ordered the elimination of at least 100 rivals. Maria Licciardi's ascent to power and her subsequent reign marked a pivotal moment in the male-dominated realm of organized crime. Under her leadership, the activities of the criminal organization were meticulously orchestrated and well-organized. Detectives occasionally found themselves begrudgingly admiring her leadership style, describing her as a woman of exceptional intelligence with the strategic acumen of a ruthless tactician. Contrary to expectations, Maria Licciardi was undaunted by the opposition posed by her male counterparts. Her fearless demeanor earned her a fearsome reputation as the godmother of the criminal world. In 2001, Maria Licciardi's name appeared on a list of the top 30 most wanted fugitives in Italy. That same year, she was apprehended and incarcerated for a range of offenses. She remained imprisoned until her eventual release in 2009. Following her release in 2009, Maria Licciardi retreated into obscurity until a recent turn of events in 2021. In that year, she was arrested at Rome's Ciampino Airport while attempting to board a flight to visit her daughter and attend to some business matters in Spain. Despite being 71 years old at the time of her arrest, the mobster remained composed during the apprehension. Maria Licciardi now faces a prison sentence of 12 years and 8 months, marking another chapter in her eventful journey in the world of crime. Moving on to May Coughlin Capone, the wife of the infamous Chicago mobster Al Capone, her significant contributions often go unnoticed in the shadow of her husband's notoriety. Born on April 11, 1897, into an Irish-American family in Brooklyn, New York, May Capone possessed discipline and studiousness from a young age. These exceptional qualities would prove invaluable during the challenging phases of her marriage to Al Capone. Following the death of her father, May left school to work at a box factory, where she reportedly crossed paths with the cunning mobster. May was 20 years old at the time, hailing from a deeply religious family. In contrast, Al Capone was 18 and already a known gangster. However, the growing love between them transcended societal judgments and the stark differences in their lifestyles. As their love affair continued, May gave birth to their first child, Albert Francis Sonny Capone, out of wedlock. Three weeks after Sonny's birth, May and Al Capone officially tied the knot in Brooklyn on December 30, 1918. A few months later, the couple relocated to the bustling city of Chicago, where Al Capone's reputation as a notorious mobster would continue to soar. However, 
May Capone chose to maintain a low profile, even as she inevitably became embroiled in controversies due to her husband's sexual escapades and frequent run-ins with the law. Despite Al Capone's profound love for May, he was entangled in numerous extramarital affairs. During one of his romantic encounters with his mistresses, he contracted syphilis, unknowingly passing the disease to May, who in turn transmitted it to their son. The consequences of this illness led to hearing impairments for both father and son. However, Capone's health deteriorated rapidly as he also suffered from a sharp decline in cognitive function. Throughout these trying times, May never uttered a complaint. She looked past Capone's infidelity and continued to care for him, as she had always done. On October 18, 1931, Al Capone was arrested for tax evasion. In a powerful display of solidarity, May unwaveringly stood by his side. She embarked on numerous journeys, covering several miles to visit the ailing mobster in a California prison facility. May also publicly defended him and tirelessly advocated for his release. When journalists inquired about Capone's well-being in prison, May responded with unwavering determination, dismissing any suggestions that he might not survive his sentence. She firmly declared, Yes, he's going to get well. He is suffering from dejection and a broken spirit, aggravated by intense nervousness. After serving eight out of his 11-year prison sentence, Al Capone was eventually released. Al Capone was released for good behavior in 1939 and was kindly treated by the mob with a weekly salary of $600, but his health had deteriorated. The notorious mobster once a shadow of his former self. He often, it is said, that he had delusional conversations with her. May's deceased friends and relatives were forced to assume the role of husband and guardian, fiercely protecting Capone from intrusive journalists and investigators who sought to exploit his fragile state to extract new confessions. As a result, the gangster was one of the first patients to receive the innovative antibiotic penicillin, but it was too late. Finally, on January 25, 1947, Capone suffered a cardiac arrest and was devastated, unable to fully recover after reports of loss, to recover himself, indicating that he avoided a second meeting, floor of their home where her husband died until his own death in a Florida nursing home on April 16, 1986. But on the other hand, he was a sweet gentleman, tricking and seducing any woman he desired. But somehow, out of the countless number of women at his disposal, a notorious Colombian trafficker decided that his ideal partner was AI, is a woman. The underage girl in Maria Victoria Hanau's character is more surprising. Victoria Hanau was receptive to Pablo Escobar's advances. She was only 13 at the time, but she was sure that 23-year-old Pablo Escobar was her prince, and he was a wonderful lover of Victoria Hanau. I was impressed by his willingness to help others and his empathy for their game at the age of 14, he explained. Victoria Hanau faced a heart-wrenching predicament after her unexpected pregnancy with Pablo Escobar. But I couldn't say anything to anyone, she recalled. A year later, in a controversial ceremony, the couple exchanged vows at the Santissima Trinidad Church in Palmyra. As anticipated, Victoria's parents and siblings strongly opposed the marriage and chose not to attend the event. Surprisingly, Escobar's family was also notably absent from the occasion. The sole relative present on their wedding day was Victoria's grandmother, who accompanied her to the church. Reflecting on her emotions after the wedding, Victoria Hanau described her happiness as bittersweet, overshadowed by the overwhelming fear of what would follow. She said, The disapproval of my parents, my siblings, the entire neighborhood, I had my heart in my throat. Victoria's early married life proved to be exceptionally complex as she juggled her role as a housewife with her education, which was both thrilling and emotionally draining. On January 24, 1977, she gave birth to their first child, Juan Pablo Escobar, while still in the fourth year of secondary school. Nevertheless, she managed to complete her education while navigating the challenges of motherhood. Over the years, the family's wealth grew rapidly, enabling Victoria to fulfill her lifelong dream of attending high-end fashion events in France and Italy and acquiring extremely expensive artwork. However, unbeknownst to her, Escobar's vast fortune was built on the illicit trade of drugs. 
He had risen to become the leader of the notorious Medellin cartel, responsible for a staggering 80% of all drug shipments into the United States. When Victoria eventually discovered the truth, she found herself with limited options. Pablo Escobar had always been the dominant force in their marriage, and she had been molded to be his wife and the mother of his children, with little room to question or challenge his choices. Victoria's love for Escobar was undeniably special, but she despised his involvement in criminal activities, particularly his numerous extramarital affairs. She endured constant gossip about his infidelities, which she found deeply painful. I used to cry all night waiting for dawn to come, she wrote in her book many years later. However, Escobar's criminal dealings soon transcended drug trafficking and marital infidelity. Members of the Medellin cartel began assassinating Escobar's political adversaries and even targeting commercial airplanes. The height of the cartel's brutality reached its zenith on April 30, 1984. A pivotal turning point in Victoria Hanau's life came when Pablo Escobar ordered the assassination of Rodrigo Lara Bonilla, Colombia's Minister of Justice at the time. This event is etched vividly in her memory as the moment when everything fell apart. Following the minister's murder, the government swiftly issued an arrest warrant for Pablo Escobar with the intention of extraditing him to the United States. Escobar had no choice but to separate from his family and go into hiding. Naturally, Victoria Hanau was deeply concerned for her safety and that of her children. However, the prospect of a life without the man she had loved and adored since she was 13 seemed unthinkable. As the year 1993 progressed, it became increasingly evident that the once mighty Escobar drug empire was rapidly crumbling. Victoria Hanau, by her own admission, felt that death was looming over her entire family. In September of that year, Pablo Escobar informed Victoria that she and their two children needed to relocate to a safe house under government protection. During their final meeting, tearful kisses and embraces were exchanged. Victoria wrote in her book many years later, I cried and cried. It was the most agonizing decision I had ever made, leaving the love of my life just as the world was closing in on him. Indeed, the world was closing in on Pablo Escobar. A few weeks after bidding farewell to his family, the Colombian police finally captured the drug kingpin on a rooftop in Medellin. While the world celebrated Escobar's downfall, Victoria and her children were engulfed in profound sadness. However, there was little time for mourning, as even in death, Escobar's illicit activities continued to cast a dark shadow over the family. Faced with an ongoing crackdown against the Medellin cartel, Victoria had no choice but to flee the country. Despite making two unsuccessful asylum applications to Germany and Mozambique, she was determined to secure her family's safety. In an effort to conceal their identities, the grieving family found refuge in Argentina. To protect themselves further, they assumed new names. Maria Victoria Hanau became Victoria Hanau Vallejos, or Maria Isabel Santos Caballero. However, their associations with Pablo Escobar eventually drew the attention of the law. In 1999, both Victoria and her son Juan Pablo were arrested for money laundering. After her release, Victoria strongly criticized the authorities in a candid interview, stating, I'm a prisoner in Argentina simply because I'm Colombian. They want to showcase Argentina's fight against drug trafficking by putting the ghost of Pablo Escobar on trial. Since then, Victoria Hanau and her children have opted to lead a quiet life away from the prying eyes of the media. However, she recently emerged from her self-imposed seclusion to release her book, Mrs. Escobar, My Life with Pablo, in which she recounts her experiences of living day in and day out with one of the world's most notorious kingpins. During a 2018 interview with Colombia's W Radio, Victoria distanced herself from the activities of the cartel and openly expressed profound sadness and shame for the immense pain her husband had caused the entire country of Colombia. She humbly sought forgiveness for her actions in her youth, saying, I ask for forgiveness for what I did in my youth. I wasn't having a good life. Across the streets and creeks of Mexico, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo is renowned as the godfather of drug trafficking and co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel. He wielded immense power and influence within Mexico's underground criminal world and even among members of the country's political elite. 
Yet, behind the scenes, he relied on the women in his life to provide the emotional support necessary to run the cartel. After his first wife succumbed to leukemia in 1968, Felix Gallardo re-entered the dating scene in search of love. It was during this search that he crossed paths with Maria Elvira Murillo, hailing from a humble farming family in Michoacan, Mexico. Maria Elvira had grown up in poverty, but her life, as well as that of her family, underwent a dramatic transformation when she crossed paths with Felix Gallardo. Not much is known about the circumstances of their initial meeting or the methods employed by Felix Gallardo to win her over. Nevertheless, it is believed that their wedding was a grand affair, with the governor of Sinaloa reportedly in attendance. Maria Elvira bore 17 children for the drug lord and was listed as one of the co-owners of the renowned Delia Real Estate. In the second season of the popular Netflix series Narcos Mexico, Maria Elvira was depicted as a loving wife who initially supported her husband's small-scale drug dealings. However, over time, she became increasingly concerned that her husband was devoting too much time to running the business, exacerbated by his extramarital affairs. As the series unfolded, Maria Elvira passionately pleaded with her husband to move the cartel's operations to Sinaloa. When he refused, she found herself with no other option but to relocate to Sinaloa with their children. Eventually, Felix Gallardo had a change of heart after surviving an assassination attempt. He fled to Sinaloa in the hopes of reuniting with his family. Initially, Maria Elvira appeared disinterested in a reunion, but she eventually gave in. After the 1988 elections, which Felix Gallardo rigged in favor of the PRI, they attended the victory party together. However, their relationship would take another turn for the worse after Maria Elvira learned of her ex-husband's involvement in the death of Guadalupe Lea Serrano and her two children. In a violent and emotionally charged scene, Maria Elvira confronted Felix Gallardo. Gallardo attempted to calm his wife, but just as he was about to explain his side of the story, she plunged a knife into his chest. It was only by luck that he survived and relocated back to Guadalajara, far from the happy ending that many viewers might have hoped for. In reality, their relationship had a different trajectory from what Narcos Mexico portrayed. There are no concrete reports of Maria Elvira complaining about Felix Gallardo's unwavering dedication to the cartel or his involvement with other women. Despite being less famous than her husband, their real-life relationship had its own unique complexities. Maria Elvira reportedly played an active role in the Guadalajara cartel's success, both before and after Felix Gallardo's arrest. In the early days of their marriage, her primary responsibility was to monitor and regulate the flow of cash. However, as time passed, she assumed more significant responsibilities, including facilitating high-level meetings between Felix Gallardo and some of the most prominent figures in Mexico's political landscape. This played a pivotal role in solidifying the cartel's position as the country's largest criminal organization and helped shield the family from the law's pursuit. Their luck took a turn for the worse in the early 1980s when top DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena infiltrated the Guadalajara cartel. However, it was in 1985 that their world came crashing down. Upon discovering Kiki's true identity, Felix Gallardo ordered his hitmen to brutally assassinate the DEA agent, hoping it would serve as a warning to rival gangs and law enforcement agencies. Kiki was kidnapped and subjected to torturous treatment, ultimately leading to his death. Contrary to their expectations, Kiki's murder triggered a relentless manhunt operation to capture Felix Gallardo. After several years of evasion and pursuit, the drug lord was finally arrested and extradited to the United States. This left Maria Elvira Murillo to fend for herself and her 17 children. To compound matters, the government seized her real estate properties. Nonetheless, Maria Elvira, known for her astuteness, managed to secure a portion of her husband's wealth, which enabled her to provide for her children. Even amid reports of her husband's deteriorating health in prison, Maria Elvira never ceased to love Felix Gallardo. Maria Elvira and her children composed a letter of complaint addressed to the Public Safety Secretary, Dinero Garcia Luna. This letter highlighted their concerns regarding the alleged mistreatment of the drug lord by prison authorities. 
It also expressed their dissatisfaction with the subpar level of medical care he was receiving. In addition to this, they initiated an appeal process in court, seeking permission for Felix Gallardo to serve the remainder of his sentence under house arrest. Regrettably, their appeal was dismissed by the court. However, shortly thereafter, Felix Gallardo was relocated to a medium security prison in Guadalajara. Emma Coronel Aispuro is undeniably one of the most influential wives of gangsters in history. Her love story with El Chapo alone secures her a place on such a list, but Emma's own endeavors during her husband's incarceration further solidify her status. She was born on July 3, 1989 in California, the same year that El Chapo broke away from the Guadalajara cartel to establish the Sinaloa cartel. Her father, Inez Coronel Barreras, held a high-ranking position within the gang and was one of El Chapo's most trusted lieutenants. According to reports, Emma initially pursued a degree in journalism in Culiacan. However, as she grew older, she began participating in various beauty contests. One notable pageant she entered was the 2007 edition of the Coffee and Guava Festival Beauty Pageant in Durango. To celebrate his daughter's participation, Inez Coronel hosted an extravagant party and extended invitations to his boss and other dignitaries. El Chapo's arrival became one of the most talked-about highlights of the event. The drug lord made his entrance into town on a small, chartered plane, and his motorcade to the event consisted of at least 200 scooters driven by armed members of the Sinaloa cartel. In typical El Chapo fashion, his entourage also included some of his mistresses. However, once his eyes fell on Emma, he was immediately captivated by her beauty. During a later interview with Telemundo, Emma Coronel recalled her first meeting with the cartel boss. We crossed paths right at the center of the dance floor, she said. He flirtatiously smiled at me. After a while, a person came to me and said, The boss is asking if you want to dance with him. And I said, Okay. At the time of their first meeting, Emma Coronel had a boyfriend, but he became inconsequential once she shared her first dance with El Chapo. This marked the beginning of her life as the queen of the Sinaloa cartel. While Emma was already one of the favorites to win the beauty contest, El Chapo wasn't willing to leave anything to chance. He was certain she would be his future wife, but wanted her to attend their wedding as a beauty queen. To achieve this, he went to great lengths to influence the judges in her favor. A few days later, she was announced as the winner of the contest. However, Emma insists that she won without external assistance and that her love for the drug syndicate was born out of genuine feelings. I would say what won me over was his way of talking, the way he treated me, the way we began to get along first as friends, and from that came everything else, she told the Los Angeles Times in a 2016 interview. In the months following the contest, Emma married El Chapo on her 18th birthday, with dignitaries in attendance, including the governor of Sinaloa. Emma Coronel gave birth to a set of twins at Antelope Valley Hospital in California three years later. However, El Chapo's arrest by the Mexican Marines came as a shocking event for her. Despite the emotional turmoil, Emma Coronel gathered her resolve and embarked on a daring mission to secure her husband's release from jail. Prior to this, El Chapo had successfully escaped from jail in 2001, but this time, the authorities were more vigilant. So, Emma Coronel devised an alternative plan. She arranged a meeting with El Chapo's four sons and Damaso Lopez, a former prison official. Together, they hatched a scheme to move El Chapo out of prison through an underground tunnel. To execute this audacious plan, Emma purchased a piece of land near the prison and acquired the necessary equipment including drilling machinery, an armored pickup truck, and a motorcycle. She also rented a sizable warehouse and a small airplane. After weeks of meticulous planning and preparation, El Chapo successfully escaped from prison through an underground tunnel on July 11, 2015. The world was left in awe by this audacious exploit, with many tabloids hailing El Chapo as a master tactician. However, his daring escape would not have been possible without Emma's assistance. Unfortunately, their reunion was short-lived, as El Chapo was re-arrested on January 8, 2016, and placed under strict surveillance. As expected, Emma was not pleased with El Chapo's living conditions in prison. She expressed her concerns to journalists, saying, 
Not everything that is said is true. I think that any human being has the right to have at least the vital things. They are not providing this to him. Before Emma could devise another escape plan for her husband, the authorities extradited him to the United States. Nevertheless, Emma was unwavering in her commitment to the love of her life. She frequently traveled between Mexico and the United States to attend El Chapo's trials, declaring, I'm in love with El Chapo. He's the father of my daughters, and I believe that I have already demonstrated that I will follow him anywhere. She publicly supported her husband and defended him at every opportunity, even in the face of the charges leveled against him. In April 2019, when El Chapo was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 30 years, Emma Coronel was present in court to support him, sharing kisses with him. Later that year, she launched a fashion brand in honor of El Chapo. Her unwavering support for the diminutive drug lord remained steadfast. However, Emma would face her own tribulations during El Chapo's reign as the cartel boss. She is believed to have played a significant role in the success of his empire, and her actions would come back to haunt her in 2021 when she was arrested in Washington for drug trafficking and money laundering activities. On May 30, 2023, she was transferred from FMC Carswell in Texas to a confinement facility operated by Long Beach Residential Reentry Management in California. In your opinion, which of these women played the most significant role in their husband's criminal enterprises?